Welcome to a webinar on Q&A with an artist, rep, and podcaster featuring Heather Elder, hosted by ASMP Mountain West Chapter President Jake Campos. Take it away, Jake. Hi, welcome. We are, uh, we are at quite a time right now. Um, this organization uh, is doing everything that we can, and I want to thank Heather for joining us, giving us something to uh, to put our attention to, and uh, and improve ourselves sure. with all this new free time at home that we have. Uh, the ASMP, if you're not familiar, has been around since 1944-45. We go back to Margaret Burke White, Robert Kappa, Ouija, Robert Cortez. We've been representing photographers and advocating for them in that time. We continue to do so, and. I'm going to share with you, we started a foundation so that even if you're not a member, you can support what we do. Um, it's, uh, it's very important to have people meeting with our leaders on Capitol Hill, advocating for us, making sure that when they draft bills like they just did, that we are represented, that they're looking at freelancers, that our industry has a say and, uh, and is not left out. So please have a have a look at this uh, at this site. Um, we are also at this time releasing a number of webinars. Tom Madry, our legal counsel, has uh, has gone through contracts and different issues that you uh, might encounter uh, with everything that's changing with all the cancellation. We have a COVID nineteen info hub, and you can see it's all different kinds of resources that we're pooling together for you. We're also having town halls so that we can speak to each other. We can bounce ideas off each other and communicate what each of us is seeing. Uh, it's for the benefit of all of us. And I really hope that you can uh, help support that. Now, back to Heather. Heather, would you like to introduce yourself and, and sort of how you came into the industry um, and into the office that, uh, that you hold right now? Sure. Um, let's see. I, how, how brief can I be here? Um, I started out in advertising as an account person and I worked on the Polaroid account and I worked on a retail account. So I had a lot of experience with photography and photo shoots and um, I was actually dating my boss at the time and it was <laughs> who is now my husband and um i we needed i needed to leave i needed to do something different and a friend of mine connected me with a photographer and i thought oh that's kind of cool i like photography i like photo shoots so i was her studio manager i was her producer i was her rep and i learned a lot um i learned a lot about the industry my, we got married and moved to san francisco and i kind of was there at a time when it was booming and or I was here at a time when it was booming and decided I really didn't know what I wanted to be. Did I want to be a producer, a studio manager, a rep? And um, Hunter Freeman was looking for a rep and I thought, wow, if, if I could represent him, I would do this. And I did. He, um, I've been representing him for over 20 years and he was the, you know, the second photographer to take a chance on me. And um, I was really here at a very like golden time in our industry in the early 90, mid 90s. And I was able to make a name for myself. And I think my advertising agency background, my client service um, training became a key value of um, how I approach my business today. Yeah, and, you, and your uh, serving experience. And my uh, serving and experience as a waitress, podcast. that was I my most- that. And it, it really struck a chord with me because I, I spent a summer uh, being wait staff. Up yeah, there. that was, was my most staff. favorite blog post I ever wrote. <laughs> yeah, it's humbling, but uh, absolutely, so, such a good experience for people's skills. Yep, yeah. definitely. And and management and translating and uh, multitasking and client service, all of it. Being a waitress, Lorianne, who uh, has been working with me forever too, we both say that you can't work with us if you haven't been a waitress, so, <laughs> or, yeah. or a waiter. So there you go, that's your internship, right? That's it, yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, excellent, so uh, I'm curious, uh, starting in San Francisco, um, that sounds like before tech had taken over everything there, and there was a ton of industry, uh, 
what were the challenges in, in getting going back then? Because it, it doesn't, was it a, a hub for photography, photographers? Oh my gosh. <clears throat> Honestly, like I make the joke all the time that I was a really good rep then, meaning I could, can't really take credit for what was happening then because there was so much work here. So it wasn't me that was getting everyone the work. It was the fact that there was so much work to be had because the tech was booming. We were doing PetSmart. I don't know if you remember them. And Apple's there, you know, Hunter did the first flower campaign with all the colored iMacs and um, Webvan and, you know, all of these amazing, um, not PetSmart, Pet, uh, what was the pet online pet company? I'm blanking right now, but. Um, there were all these really famous creative campaigns that were happening at the time. And the photographers that I were working, I was working with was, were getting access to them um, because the, the ad agency was just, you know, the ad community here was booming. Yeah. Well, so the challenges at the time were, you know, to make a name for myself. I was new, I was young, nobody knew who I was here. Um, Fortunately, I had been in advertising for a little while and I had friends that had lived out here and I knew them and I was kind of able to get into agencies that way. But otherwise, it really was a, a really fantastic time to start to be a rep. Oh, it sounds like it. Yeah. And uh, so I just just to uh, just to uh, take care of uh, one bit of business here. We've had some questions from uh, from people that they uh, they said in ahead of time. We um, just wanted to say. Uh, the format of this uh, of this webinar is I'm going to do a quick interview with Heather, and then we're going to do some Q and A's. Uh, we're not going to be speaking about things that aren't Heather's strength and aren't her business, and and uh, where she can't give us uh, expert advice, uh, being medical work and and uninsurance and all that kind of stuff, uh, and. So just so everybody knows, we're gonna Heather and I are gonna do a little back and forth, uh, and then we're going to open it up to your questions um, uh, that are focused on the industry and Heather's unique perspective as a rep and with her history. So, um, all right. Well, so I'm curious uh, as you you know from where you started into how how many artists do you represent now? Ten. 10. Okay. And is it all uh, photographers, directors, videographers? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. Not all the photographers. Yeah, actually all the photographers do motion. Yes. Okay. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really incredible. Um, I'm curious, what have you learned uh, and seen uh, works best in scaling up an operation. If you are just a photographer, if you're working on smaller things and then you get a call and it's a big client knocking, how, how have you seen uh, your clients and others scale up to meet those challenges? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. I think the first way is you have to surround yourself by the best people and you can't wait to find those people until you get the phone call. So you need to know who your team is going to be and you need to have practiced and you know, done shoots with them so that you're experienced and you need, really need to be a well-oiled machine long before that call comes in. And the way you become that is by testing and shooting the editorial or you know, collaborating with other people to come up with projects that you can shoot for yourself. Um, because you, you just, it's practice. You just have to be prepared um, so that when that phone call comes, you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. And, and along with that, uh, how much are you encouraging or demanding your clients uh, shoot their own personal work on a regular basis, be, be creating uh, new content that is apart from a, from a client? Oh, yeah, that's, that's crucial. Um, I think that's the single most important thing a photographer can be doing. And if they're not doing that, they should be, you know, networking and showing their work. But um, the, their work is their inventory. So if you don't have new work to show, whether it be them or me, you have, you have no inventory. So you have no work to share. You have no work to sell. You have no work to put in an ad or put on social media. So 
you need to create new work. Um, that's literally the, the income source of what you're doing. It will, new work will get, hopefully, new work. Right, work begets work. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, if, uh, if those of you tuning in haven't been to Heather's website, we're gonna, we're gonna go through some of the uh, photographers and their presentations and such. But if you go to her website, I, I didn't list uh, in your description, but you've been a blogger for some time now as yeah. well. You were a blogger before you were a podcaster, correct? Uh huh. Yep. I, yeah. you know, I, I somebody was asking me the other day how old it is, and I, I don't even know. I think maybe ten years. I'm not sure, but I recognized. You know, we always joked that it was like me, Lauren, and the FedEx guy at the time when we would send out portfolios, and we are very much in a vacuum. The way that we do things and you know, in San Francisco, we were very fortunate that we had um, a really strong community of reps. So we would share creative lists and we would call each other and, and you know, connect on things. And I realized like, wow, like, I actually feel like I have an office and I have colleagues that I can ask questions of. And when blogging kind of became a thing and I've always enjoyed writing and community is so important to me, I think it's because I was and I'm an only child, so I always felt like <laughs> I always wanted to be at my friends' houses who had all the people at it, all the brothers and sisters. And I just felt like we, as a community or as an industry, we didn't have a, a voice. So I thought it was a really fantastic opportunity for me to connect with photographers and reps and art producers and creatives and kind of just share and have conversations about all the, the important things about how we can all better work together and better understand each other. So the, the blog was fantastic for that. And then the podcast, you know, was natural after that. Yeah. And I, I guess, can we just flash, uh, if you're, if you're um, able to share your screen, just uh -huh. flash to uh, your podcast and your blog. Um, just sure. so that people can see and, and write down the link so that they can check yeah. those out. The podcast so, or the, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. I just have to find, let's see. Um, you can find the podcast on iTunes. Um, it's just called Dear Art Producer. It doesn't have its own web website. But um, if you also go to um, my website, um, let's Sorry, it's taking a second to load. At the end, it's just at the very end of the menu bar, it says connect and podcast. And there you have a link to the Dear Art Producer and there you have a link to the blog, Notes from a Reps Journal. Yeah, and one thing, yeah, I, I was on your, your blog this morning. I, I was just looking at the dates that you posted things and it was, you know, two days after the last post, five days after that, it was, you have, an output that's uh, that's really impressive. You're constantly doing this. Uh, we are constantly doing it. And I'm fortunate that I don't have to do this alone. Um, I have some people that help me. Um, all of, and we, our goal is, you know, we want to be kind of this content creation machine. And we want to put information out there for not just about our photographers, but also our industry. And, um, you know, it's it's got quite a good following. And I think, um, people trust it. So I'm trying to stay true to that community value of mine and share relevant content as often as we can. Tell us about being an artist rep because a lot of us uh, in this industry, like yourself, you started in one area and then moved slowly to the other. And it sounds like what you're doing now is the fit for you. Um, can you tell me about finding that? And then what about the job makes it so great and what about the job is going to make it not the right fit for somebody else okay so let's see um it's really a big question because the job that i had when i started in the 90s was amazing <laughs> it was really fun and you know very social and very um creative and exciting i felt like i was part of campaigns that were just um inspiring and changing daily. Um, and I loved that because I had worked at a really creative agency and I, I loved continuing to um, be surrounded by really creative people doing really interesting things. And, you know, over the years, things have changed. And while I am still surrounded by creative people and I'm still loving the 
the projects that we work on and are so appreciative of the jobs and the, the inspired by all of the people that work on them, it's a different industry. You know, what I do is, you know, I used to take around portfolios and host parties and do estimates. And while there is definitely skill to that, um, now what I do is incredibly different. Um, not only do I do all of those things as well, but you know, we, we look at ourselves as a content creation agency for our creatives, our, our talent. And we are looking to figure out what is visually possible for our clients, which is more relevant today than ever. And I've been saying that for quite some time that that's what we're doing, but you know, what is visually possible today? I, we're all trying to kind of figure that out. Um, we are, you know, trying to be that partner for, we're trying to connect our clients with the right talent to figure out, help them figure out, you know, how to solve their problem and how to be their creative partner. Um, but on top, you know, my to-do list is insanely long. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and I, I will say, uh, your, what you're putting out is unlike anything I'm seeing from any other rep, uh, we're, we're uh, I guess, agency that represents photographers. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I've been working with a really great consultant who's a dear friend and colleague for 20 years. And about two years ago, we realized, I mean, we knew that the agency was changing, but I had a very strong opinion that a photographer's images couldn't speak for themselves anymore. So remember back when you, you know, when we were showing portfolios and you know, I would say, oh, look at this beautiful image. Isn't, isn't it great? Well, that would be enough because someone would be like, oh my God, I absolutely want to work with Andy Anderson or, oh my gosh, yes, I love this Tim Tatter image. Excuse me. Right. And they would therefore want to hire them. And that exists today for sure. There are people that see an image, are inspired by it and want to work with someone for it. Um, but I just really believed um, that it was very important for a photographer to realize they can't just let their images speak for themselves. They have to begin to think of themselves as a brand. And a brand isn't just like change your logo or, you know, and a brand isn't a category. A brand's not, I'm a lifestyle photographer, therefore I'm a brand. Um, you know, you have to dig really deep to figure out what your brand is and what you stand for. What is it that you, that is really important to you. And that took a long time. Um, that took a good year and a half for us to do with all of our photographers and figure out um, who they are because they communicate visually. They don't want photo therapy to figure out who they are. <laughs> they, they don't want to dig deep and, you know, put words to their images and words to their, their vision. Um, you know, and, and I'm, again, I'm being very general and, but it was, it was hard. It was, it was a long process. And, but the benefits have been huge. You know, we now have a point of view for each one of our photographers. Um, and if, unless you have a question about that, it might be a good time to pop over to my website and I can That's share. That's exactly where I was going. Yeah. Yeah. Let's okay. do that. Let's share again. I can show you what I mean. I'm actually in the middle of redoing my website. I feel like this was this current version is a great version to communicate what we're talking about right now, but there's so much more that I can do and that I offer my clients. I feel like right now, when you're looking at my website, you see imagery, you see, um, and, and it does expect the images to speak for themselves. So I'm, I'm trying to change that to be, to communicate a little bit more about what it is that we do. But, um, for now, I think, you know, it, it does what it's supposed to do. So <clears throat> each photographer has what we call a vision statement. So if you click into, let's just use Andy Anderson as an example. And I feel like, you know, every photographer also communicates what they do in a different way. So um, we start out by figuring out what is each photographer's brand, as I said, and we do that through a vision statement. And if you were to go to, this is Andy's profile page, and if you click on that, you get his vision statement. And the idea, Andy's vision is through curiosity. And, you know, Andy is a man of the outdoors and he has learned so many lessons from the life that he's lived outdoors. 
And he believes, this quote here, that along with being a photographer comes the responsibility to use this powerful tool to tell the stories about the joy of discovery that curiosity offers. So you could, at another time, you can go back and kind of review the vision statement of Andy's, but it really kind of sets the foundation and allows me to have the language around which to talk to, about Andy. So then <clears throat> if you're an art producer and you're on my site and you're looking to learn more about Andy, there's a few different ways to do that. You know, here you could click, I'm not going to do it right now because it'll just start, but there's a video about Andy. Um, these are all the individual portfolios that have to do with Andy. But then there's something here that <clears throat> I added, excuse me, called 12 Days of An Instagram, which is this project we did about all the lessons that Andy has learned from a life lived outdoors. Um, that kind of helps solidify that. There's, um, well, where's, where's his projects and stories? Sorry, hold on a second. Yeah. Carry on. Heather, I'm, I'm just getting a little bit of tremors here. So I'm just going to make sure I've got things in line. If you don't mind carrying on there. Sure. I'll be right back. Right back. Okay, sure. No problem. So then we have this section, which I think is a really important section. It's called projects and stories. And I was feeling like <clears throat> um, it was also very limiting to show a photographer's project without the story that went along with it. So here's a project where Andy um, photographed gang members on the south side of Chicago. And along with it, we wrote a story. So that if you were interested in checking out Andy Anderson's project, you also had access to the story that went along with it. So kind of going back to Andy's profile page, um, you know, the other thing that tells Andy's story is, you know, maybe clicking through to his Instagram account if you want. Um, or clicking through to his motion. So moving on to Tim Tatter, who's next. Tim's vision is the idea of fearlessness. He creates not just images, but motion and fine art. Everything that Tim creates is designed to elicit a response. So when we talk about Tim Tatter, we do it with the language around this idea that he's a fearless visual communicator. So, um, You'll, you can read through the vision statement that we wrote for him, but you know when I then go and talk about him either in a, a Instagram story or, or Instagram captions maybe, or a email blast or another blog post, I'm doing so with that vision that we've created for him. What does Tim Tatter stand for? That, that is what we, um, that is what we, communicate in any t any time I talk about Tim. Um, and then when, you know, we are talking to clients and brands, I can align a photographer with a brand um, much easier. So if, you know, all things are equal and there's three people being considered for a job and this is maybe for Nike sunglasses, we can, we can create our treatment around this idea of fearlessness and this idea of epic imagery that elicits a response. And there's all this backup information now in terms of content that we've created and that other people have picked up and shared that um, speaks to that as well. Yeah, I, I'm curious, we've had, I had the question, others have had similar questions. How do you bring in new work? Some of these personal projects that the photographers have been working on and, uh, and, and say, you know, they've had a, another business uh, that's, you know, a little more stock, or if they shoot lifestyle, it's more studio, uh, something like that. How do you, how have you seen those things be integrated well? I'm not sure I'm following your question. Well, so you, you've got like to- Like integrated to what? Into, into the, their greater presentation. So uh, if Tim Tatter decided to, show off this automobile uh, portfolio that he'd been working on for a while. Uh -huh. How, you know, or, or any other photographer that has a, a somewhat different genre than is, is shown in all of their other work, how do you, uh, how do you suggest how do I pull that, in? Bring that in and, and yeah. how have you seen others do that well? I actually don't think it's an issue once you've defined your brand. So, it, Tim is about creating fearless imagery. 
image, you know, anything. And it's not just imagery, like I said, but any of the work that he creates, even his fine work, he wants to elicit a response. So it doesn't matter if he shoots a car, if he shoots a, or photographs a car or a dog or a, you know, a professional athlete. Um, he's going after it in the same way. And I learned that back when I started representing Hunter Freeman because he shot everything. He shot studio, people, cars, you know, he was directing TV commercials. And I, you know, being my marketing background, I was like, oh my gosh, what envelope do we put you in, Hunter? We never knew. And um, I was like, you know what, actually, let's just show your best work. That's what Hunter does. Like, and that kind of, I don't know, I think that was kind of a little training ground for me. Um, and now that we have these vision statements that we, it's very easy, like Doug Menue, um, you know, his, his vision statement, vision is all about this idea of shared humanity. We all are in this together. So any imagery, any, any image he creates, there's a sense of, of <clears throat> excuse me, of understanding and empathy and um, this idea that, um, you know, he captures those everyday moments that he wants to connect people and cultures and just kind of reminding us of who they are. So it doesn't matter to me what, what Doug shoots as long as it pays off that vision statement. And he, it's funny because I don't think he can shoot anything that doesn't pay off his vision statement because it's so true to who they are. Um, does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a unity uh across yep. everything that they're, yeah. that they're doing it. and it feels like if you're if you're doing what you said earlier developing your brand and shooting what's true to you what you find truly fascinating and connect with then that's going to come out if you're shooting if doug does a does a car shoot there's going to be a connection a, 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 a humanity in that naturally yeah yeah, Doug is going to shoot a car very different than Tim Tatter will shoot a car, than Andy Anderson will shoot a car, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I'd like to say, too, like, if you're, if you're listening and you're thinking about, oh, my gosh, this is kind of cool. I want to figure out what my brand is and what I stand for. Just know you really can't do that alone because it's a challenging process and you need an outside voice to help you see yourself in a different way. This isn't about capabilities. This isn't about I have a daylight studio or I shoot with natural light or I've got this cool, you know, equipment. It's not that. It's it's what are the the experiences that you've had in your life that have defined who you are today and determined who you are as a photographer. And I don't think that's something you can do on your own. Yeah. So, uh, so tell me how how would you suggest photographers and uh, and content creators go about getting that outside consultation? I mean, do you do smaller consultations with people or or I, sometimes? Um, you know, right now I'm knee deep in trying to keep us all afloat, staying relevant, and you know maybe in a few weeks if we're still in this same position and I've got some free time, there might be, uh, uh, you know, possibilities for that. Um, right now, my focus is on the photographers that I currently represent and keeping them relevant. Yeah, a lot on your plate. Yeah, but, um, but I do think there's really great consultants out there. And I think everybody in, in our industry is surrounded by people who care and know about them really well. Like you don't have to hire a consultant, sit down with someone and have some, some frank conversations. There's good books about like figuring out how to brand yourself and what do you stand for? Um, you know, Dave. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think you have to go pay someone, although if you could, that'd be great. I also think you can, you know, surround yourself by the people who know you the best and, and maybe people who don't know you either. And, Talk about who you are and what are the value. What are your values? Um, I think those are. That's just really important. Yeah, absolutely. It's that's one of the things that as a as a chapter leader, I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I've really struggled uh, with trying to figure out how. You know, it's a hard thing, as I'm sure you know, getting art directors, uh, creative directors to respond 
to try, you know, to look at your work, let alone a, a group of people's work. Um, how do you go about contacting potential new clients? Well, I mean, I've been doing it for a really long time. So I think there's a difference between me contacting someone and a photographer directly contacting someone. So, um, I mean, I have a pretty thick skin. You know, like I, as I said, I've been doing this for a long time. So I have relationships with people and, you know, distribution channels that are wide. And so it's really easy for me to reach out to someone and say, hey, Doug's going to be in town or you know, Cade's going to be in town, you know, would you be available to see them? And I'm also not afraid to email someone that I don't know. Um, I think for a photographer, it really depends on the level of photographer, obviously, and how long they've been in the business and what their relationships are. If you're a brand new photographer and you're trying to break in, I've always said, own your backyard first, um, get to know everybody in your area and that you can. And after that, add another area and try and be the expert in that area and, and, and know everyone you can there. As opposed to thinking about the country as this big, huge country, you know, and I've got to get to know everyone. Like that's taken me 25 years and I still don't know everyone. So, um, you know, I think, you, and you just have to be polite and, and not want anything from anyone. You know, the, the emails that are like, hey, here's my website, Heather, what do you think? Is like, that's like me saying to you, hey, Jake, can you just take a quick picture for me? Like that's like, right. that doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. If I were to look at your website and tell you what I think, it's a long conversation. I have a lot of questions for you first and I then have to look at it. It's like, otherwise my answer is going to be like, yeah, cool. Looks nice. Like cool imagery. You know, mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to reach an art director, don't ask them to take a look at your website. Just say, Hey, I know you work on this project. That was a really cool project. I really liked this about that shot you know here's my website if you ever you know you want to get to know somebody new yeah well and you'd mentioned uh years ago or that you had hosted parties and done more social things with them and that it sounds like that's that's going more by the wayside oh no 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 we're definitely still doing that um oh. being social is um a very big part of what i do and i co-market with another rep and we do joint parties and um yeah that, no so that that is definitely i take people out to dinner i show up on photo shoots i'm you know hosting parties and events so that is definitely a big part of what i do well and the nice thing about those too is, is it's a it's a different context right than meeting somebody in their office during working hours definitely. it's a more casual thing they get to see other people from the industry from the community uh, I ask a lot of people. I ask them to look at my emails. I interrupt their day with my emails. I ask them to look at my photographer's work. I ask them if they, I can host a portfolio show, if they can meet my photographers. So I'm constantly asking things of people. So when I host events or co-host events with other, another rep, I, I want to say thank you. I want to have a, a place where people don't aren't asked like I'm not asking anyone anything, I'm saying thank you. So if I'm taking someone out to dinner, I really don't wanna talk about my photographers. I wanna to get to know them. I wanna hear about their kids. I wanna see pictures of their dogs. I wanna, um, you know, hear how they're doing and, and just not ask for something anymore. Yeah, not make it work, right? The last not thing make it work. Not work. Yeah. Okay, so I, I guess to bring us to this moment now, to finally talk about what's going on around us now, what um, is that? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, the, the uh, panel discussion that you had on Friday with Workbook was really enlightening. Some of the things that came out of that, the different, uh, different ways that we might be building contracts, the different uh, revenue streams that we might be looking at now. Um, can you kind of talk about that a, a little bit? Tell us what what do you see happening in the industry and what are you hearing from uh from your contacts yeah um again a big question um i think everybody is in the same boat right now we're all feeling very reactive in terms of you know we've had a complete shutdown of most of our business i think there's probably a few little things trickling here and there um maybe people who can work in studios maybe people who can 
I, I, I can't even speak to who's doing what, but I'm sure there's a few little things happening there. Um, we've had to completely pivot and we built a stock site um, overnight, um, over one weekend. Basically, we created a place where we could collect and curate a group of images that a, you know that an agency can go to and maybe get inspired or maybe purchase an entire library. So for example, um, this is a really great example. Um, Jason Lindsay had this collection of imagery called Cabin Fever. And here it is. And we curated it, put it together in a portfolio on the stock site and sent out an email blast to people saying, hey, this is available. You can purchase single images or you can purchase collections. Mm -hmm. So we've been really concentrating on figuring out how to pivot in this industry um, and how to be, how to provide solutions for our clients. So I'm on the phone all the time with all of our clients saying, you know, what are you up to? What are your needs? What are your pain points right now? How can we help you? Um, a lot of people right now don't even know what their needs are or what their pain points are. They can't get things produced. So, um, you know, so I'm trying to offer people visual solutions for right now. And I don't know what the future is going to look like. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of live streaming going on. But if things are still bad enough that a client can't get on, it, on an airplane and we're going to need to live stream something, it's probably bad enough for us to not get a crew together. So, you know, I, I don't know what that's going to look like just yet because whatever happens now in the next few weeks is going to inform what our future looks like. And we don't, we don't even know what now looks like. So. Right. And one of the things I, I found interesting uh, from that workbook um, discussion was you'd think coming out of this, oh, people are going to be desperate for work. Things are just going to be cheaper. But when you consider there needing to be other measures taken, that things might be in short supply, you can easily see that a production could cost more. And so- okay. This is so important and I'm gonna like, I really wanna communicate this. We have worked really hard as an industry for so forever. ASMP like is championing this. This idea that we don't underbid, we don't undercut each other. We, our usage is valuable. And if we go, come out of this and we start slashing our fees and underbidding each other, and you know, trying to undercut and lower things because we're so desperate to, to be working, um, we're gonna, like, it's gonna be a race to the bottom. And we will never get our fees back. Um, and we will never, usage will be gone, like literally. So, and I'm not saying that we can't evolve or be, um, the, be what we need to be whenever we come out of this in terms of, you know, if budgets have been reduced, well, okay, we need to figure that out together. But this can't, we can't start right this very second bidding jobs for when we come out and, and slashing our fees so much and, and reduce asking our crew to come in less just because we want to get a job. Um, right. We have to try and maintain the standard of what we've all built as a community for so long. Otherwise, it's it's not coming back. Right. And and we were talking uh, before we went live about usages. And I think one of the one of the maybe first areas somebody might look at uh, providing value for their uh, for their clients who are in a tough spot. I, I mean, it has to be said. Um, they're going through every company is going through some real shocks right now, but uh, usages giving those away. If you look at you know all along, there's been an argument for giving more and more away over the past I don't know how many years, right? Probably as yeah. long as has been around, really. Yeah. And what you were telling me was that in this moment that stock that you just showed me from your different photographers, they're able to license that because that usage was built in. 
Correct. That's now imagery. That's the uh, what well, it, it was. Uh, I had a word for it. It's stock. It, it's inventory. Yeah, it's it's inventory. Absolutely. So you know, in two thousand and eight, when everything crashed. I, I, there were many photographers who were able to stay alive because they were able to sell extra usage on current jobs to the clients who had purchased them, right? After 2008, there definitely was a trend where, you know, libraries of images came around and clients wanted to own, own all the imagery um, forever. So unlimited use, unlimited time was given away, you know, and, and I know as a rep and many other, all other reps I know, try very hard to not sell unlimited usage, unlimited time. Um, just because a lot of times we feel like we have to price it in a way that is not affordable. Um, but then that becomes an extra value, right? If you really want a job and you're trying hard and you're trying to be competitive, you know, maybe you give away the, maybe you do like give the license away for not a lot of money. I'm not sure, you know, it, it varies. Mm -hmm. um, However, one of the very first things we did when this happened was every photographer went in and made a list of what are all their open in all their open jobs and um, what usage is coming up. And we sent out emails to everybody. Hey, your usage is coming up in the next few months. Just keep in keep it in mind if you're looking for content and you want to relicense it. So, you know, they're not all going to hit, but some might. Um, yeah, it's good to be proactive on that, too. It's really important. Um, yeah, because they might not be thinking about it. Oh yeah, I have this current li these current libraries. The other right. things our photographers are doing are ch in terms of usage is they're checking in with their current clients and they're saying, hey, remember that library that you purchased from me? You can still use that because you've got that usage. Let me help you repurpose that imagery somehow. Let's create something else with it. Um, so you know that's been a really positive sign too. Like how are we how are we creating helping you visual solutions now like how are we helping you create in a time where your hands are tied yeah no absolutely i mean it, it, because when this is all over and throughout this you want to keep those relationships you want you know people need to make money and if they have a license that's open you have to look at that at the very least but at the same time you want to keep that relationship with the client you want to help them get through it strong and able to hire you back on job yeah, you're not just a vendor like I really believe that the photography photographer role has changed so much. Like I used to say, oh, you know, so-and-so will be a creative partner for you. Well, great. That used to mean you would check out your layouts and you would work together on a vision for that project and we we're going to partner on this and be done. I think nowadays it's much bigger than that. Um, you know, photographers are being looked at, you know, also as as creative directors creative partners in the sense that they're they are literally helping the creatives figure out what they're going to create what are all the visual possibilities that they can have and add to a campaign that they're doing um, so they are truly partnering with them so why can't a client an agency a brand go back to a photographer they've already created content with and think of more ideas to create more content with out of those that, those libraries that they've already created yeah definitely and, and even uh, another that's even a, a further um, reason to do more of your own personal work to have that uh, yeah. that workflow figured out to be used to you're on site you've got you know six shots that you definitely want to get but then you've got some extra time you know you're waiting for a talent or a location or, or whatever it is what are you going to do with that time to to get more assets and to add to the story and, and when I, when you might not have a creative director yeah. when yeah. with personal work when you almost always don't have a creative director great thank you so much <clears throat> from neil binkley do art producers want to get marketing messages from photographers right now you know i my personal opinion is that your messages need to be solutions oriented. However, I was on the webinar the other day with an art producer. And when I said that, she was like, I actually think I'm going to challenge you on that because my day is so crazy and busy and all over the place. Like I like getting, um, you know, nice, calm images that remind me of what life was before. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So for me and my group, 
we are being very solutions oriented in our communications. However, that doesn't mean everybody needs to be. Um, I bet there are lots of people out there who are interested in just seeing a really beautiful image. I would be careful and make sure you're not being tone deaf and, you know, be just be very clear on, you know, just, just, yeah, maybe get someone else's opinion on what you're going to share if it's not solutions oriented to make sure it doesn't, you know, fall flat. From Lisa Corson, are art buyers using more stock that for current projects? I'm getting more stock requests for sure. Um, I, I can't, it hasn't been long enough to know if they are, um, if it's a trend that's going to be continuing, but I, I'm, I'm betting on it because I'm creating a whole stock section of my site. Also from Lisa, how do you get the word out regarding archives when buyers' emails are unknown? And how do you find those emails? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, there are great services that you can buy into that will give you access to, um, to their emails. Um, that's how I've done it over the years. Um, and I, I think that's really the, you know, and through your relationships, but that's the best, best way. From Karen Folk, how do you find a gallery that sells photography since many prefer other forms of art? I would start in your own backyard, figure out who the galleries are. There's so many beautiful galleries that concentrate on photography. Um, so I, yeah, start in your own backyard and just get bigger. From Nicola Troller, how often do you take on photo new photographers and how do you select them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for, you know, I can go years without bringing on new talents and, um, one of my goals in the last couple of years was to um, really curate our group faster. So make changes faster within our group. So we've brought on four new photographers in the last year, um, but we've also parted ways with a couple of photographers in the last year. So um, I would say, it's, it's not really, oh, I, we bring on two a year sort of thing. We're a small boutique um, company. So I, I don't want too many photographers, but I do need to be, I'll take on as many as I need to in order to stay relevant for my clients and be a resource that my clients need. From Ryan Shanley, knowing there will be lots of work once we're past this, <clears throat> will, emerging, will emerging photographers have a greater chance of getting hired? Or will there be any work for new people with established photographers hungry for work? That's a great question. I wish I had a crystal ball to answer it. I am very hopeful that once we are out of this, there will be a backlog of work that needs to be created and there will be opportunities for emerging photographers because maybe people's regular go-to photographers will be busy. So um, I would spend this time getting prepared, doing your, you know, getting to know the people that you want to work with, um, updating your website, updating your communications, you know, be ready to go once the green light is hit. I don't know what it'll look like then, but be ready. Can I ask you a quick question on that? Uh-huh. <clears throat> uh, in... You're, you're saying every one of your artists has photo and video capabilities at this point. How have you seen photographers bring, a, bring in those new skill sets and scale up well? Practice, you know, um, and each person does it differently. My strategy when we said uh, when uh, video in motion was a thing, became a thing, um, I just said, you have to have a solution. You, you don't have to be the person who's actually taking the video. Um, you just have to have a solution for your clients. And you have to have examples of it on your website because you, they're not calling me and saying, hey, does Joe Smith shoot video? And I say, oh yeah, but it's not on the website yet, right? But he does it, right? They're looking at the website on their own. And if they don't see 
options or they don't see enough or they're comparing you to someone else who has a ton of it, you're, you're going to get looked over. I'm not even going to know that you were considered. You know, I used to know when people got considered because they'd call in a portfolio. They'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, send me Hunter Freeman's portfolio. I'd be like, oh, okay, great. Oh, Hunter, you're being considered for a job. Um, I don't know. I have no idea now. So that's why when people say like housekeeping is so important right now, get your website in order, get clean up the old imagery, get it off, get the new imagery that you've been wanting to on there. Do you have motion that you've been working on and you need to edit, you need to add music, you need whatever it is you need to do. Have you created a reel? Like do that now so that you, when we say be ready, it means, it doesn't mean, oh God, I still have to update my website or, oh, I haven't updated my workbook page or, oh, you know, whatever it is, like do all of those updates, clean house now um, so that your best foot is forward. If an opportunity comes your way, you might not even know the opportunity is coming your way because they're looking at your website, but um, just yeah. get clean house now. Yeah. And to, to second that, just because I have been spending so much time doing that myself, it's, it's like another personal project. It's taking a project from start to finish. And there's so much that I've been, that I've learned along the way, you know, just like combining these sets of images or, uh, or, you know, I want to go out and, and shoot this and present it. It is that from start, from the initial idea to getting your, uh, your shots lined out, your creative direction, getting on site, executing, and then getting that all together into a package that's yeah. and help each other have nice shot here and there but getting everything all together figuring out you know how to what the deal is with licensing music or transitions or uh all these other services yeah. that come up with video you know the codex and and so many so many things as photographers as stills people first yeah. that are completely foreign so uh, yeah I, I absolutely second that Okay. From Mary Hagman, how does one gather testimonials or ratings? Um, I don't know about ratings. I'm not sure where you would be rated, but um, testimonials, I mean, I would, I'm never afraid to ask for them. Um, you know, I always send a thank you email to people um, after a shoot and ask them how it went and they'll write something back. And if it's, you know, well written and interesting, I might say, can I use that um, on our website or can I use that in a treatment or um, so I wouldn't just, I would just ask for them. From Jody Jones, what are some creative ways to make money right now? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, besides like, you know, mining for usage or sharing your work as stock, um, you know, I would say reach out to your network of people and see what they're doing. And if there's ways that you can collaborate, is there any way that we can, you know, you can offer your research abilities to clients? I, I honestly, I don't know enough about you to know specifically for yourself. Um, and I, I know that it's a really hard time right now financially for a lot of people. And there's just, there's not enough work to go around for all of us. From Jeb Graff, do you know a source for pricing when it comes to GIFs and cinema graphs? I haven't had much luck finding any info on ranges, licensing, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, no, I don't know a good source for that. I think it really varies for us. We charge, you know, anywhere from $500 to $3,000 to create one and the usage involved depends on the complexity, it depends on the, the scale of the job. Is it something we just wanna throw in? Is it something, um, you know, are they combining it with still images or is it an actual motion that they're using? Um, I, I'm fortunate that I have, you know, a bunch of photographers that do them. So I can look at past jobs that we've done and what we've charged for them. So I feel like I've got a good sense of it. Um, so I would say if you can't pull from what you've charged in the past and what people have paid in the past, I would get a group of people together and ask them what they've, you know, charged and kind of come up with a consensus that way for yourself. From Brian James, 
How do you overcome the challenge of representing 10 artists when it comes to presenting their work to clients? Does the diversity of their work help you yourself diversify your clients? Yeah, it's crucial that I have a diverse group of talent to share because I'm definitely a, a visual resource for my clients. So um, that's very important. When I present them, I do it in a portfolio show environment or I do it online where I kind of give them a tour of my website like I did a little bit with you guys today. So um, I, it's, it's not too many. I mean, in a portfolio setting, you, it's kind of cool. All the books are out on the table and people just kind of walk around and, and look at them. Um, but I think in, a, um, on an, in an online setting, I can ask someone what they're working on and, and just show them the relevant work. From Heather Welsh, I'm a photojournalist wanting to transition into ad work. What type of crew does one need to assemble to be a well-oiled machine? Yeah, I think, um, you know, photo, photojournalism and, you know, it, it's mostly just you out there with a camera. So there needs to be, commercial work requires some production value, meaning, you know, somebody styled the talent, you know, so if somebody cast the talent, then you styled the talent and there's hair and makeup involved. And, you know, are you on a set? So what does that set look like? Or are you, or are you on location? And okay, let's redress that location a little bit so that, you know, it, it gives us, it uh, gives a sense of production value. Um, so as opposed to having gone out and, you know, documented, an actual real life situation. So even when in a commercial photography, when they say they want real people talent or they want it to feel real, they still want it produced. So, um, you know, I would say you can start off, um, you know, finding, finding people in your community in your, or in your industry that you can collaborate with and come up with an idea and then execute that. From Bill Morgan. Generally speaking, how much of a body of work should someone have in place before seeking representation? You know, I don't think it's as much about how much work you have, but what experiences, what have you done on your own to represent yourself? So I find that my most successful relationships are when a photographer has been out with their portfolio and knows how hard that is. They understand how to send out a, you know, a postcard mailing or they are already doing their email blasts and they have created a list of people that they have contacts with. They have an income already that they're not depending on a rep for right away because a rep is, that's gonna take a long time to kind of get your messaging figured out and get your book around the country and um, all of that. So. I would say you absolutely need to have a, a full por portfolio of work for sure. That's kind of a given. But beyond that, you really have to understand what's involved and what's involved in marketing. From Heather Doran, what do you think of asking a business owner whose company is shut down now uh, to provide them photos for their own use while, so you can use the photos for your own portfolio or stock? Uh, yeah. I mean, again, not sure of anybody's shelter in place situation and being careful of, you know, shooting, taking all of that out of the equation. I've always been a big fan of, um, oh, are you, do you want, you know, are you interested in shooting chocolate? Well, go to Cho Chocolate and see if you can photograph, you know, photograph their product and photograph their stores and whatever it is and then in exchange you know they can use the images and in exchange you get them from lisa corson i've already had a national magazine ask for free photo usage because of this crisis how do i respond to people asking for free images without burning bridges for future work yeah that's really hard i i think it really comes back to the relationship you have already had with those people so if you don't have a relationship with them, I mean, there's nothing wrong with standing up for yourself and saying why you can't give that image for free. 
you know, they're not being asked to come into work for free. So why should you be giving your inventory for free? Um, so I, I don't know. I, I mean, there's, there's a case to be made to give, let them use it. If they're a really great client and they need it and you are, are helping them solve a problem. Yeah, maybe depends. Um, but if that doesn't make you comfortable and you don't want to do that, then I would say to say so confidently. Okay. From Charles Waldorf, as to licensing fees in this time that we're in, how do you deal with them when you give a quote based on industry standards and then be told you're two to three times higher than other bidders? Yeah, that's, that's really hard. Um, I think you, the, what, what makes it hard is you don't know who you're bidding against sometimes. And in those situations, it may not be apples to apples. And I'm going to bid my usage based on my experiences in my career across the board of many, many, many photographers. So I'm not, I know that my numbers are not out of line because I've been paid them before. Um, that doesn't mean to say that the people I'm bidding against might not have the same fee structure or experiences as me. So that sucks for me in that case then because they might not choose me because I might be too high. So then if I'm given the chance, I have to decide, is it worth me rethinking my approach or restructuring my fees so that I can come in lower? And it really is a depending, a situation that is, is it's situation dependent. I, each, each situation I would handle very differently. Judy Rosenthal, what is a workbook page you referred to? Um, the workbook is a source book of, I mean, it used to just be a book um, of you take out an ad as a photographer and you show your imagery and someone who needs a resource and some inspiration can flip through it. They have a great website um, now and a really great blog and um, they're a big supporter of the community. For sure, they are worth checking out. From Tracy Brown, for a regional photographer who mostly works with in-house marketing departments or small agencies, does a site like Wonderful Machine or similar make sense? Yeah, I think I think um, any any way that you can make connections and collaborate with people and have an outside voice in your marketing, I can't stress that enough. Um, having somebody else tell you not what to do, but what they're hearing or what they're they're the sense that they're getting in the industry or what they're hearing from other artists that they work with is so important. We talked about this earlier, this idea of us working in a vacuum. And we do, we get very caught up in our own creativity or our, our own messaging or our own point of view. And if we're not out there talking to other people or letting people who have different views or points of views or maybe workflows or anything different into your world, you, run the risk of not putting out the right message or or missing an opportunity or being perceived as missing the boat or something so i would say if you have an opportunity to be a part of a group somehow absolutely take it from glenn clark do you recommend offering up a photography service that is not a strength of the photographer if you're still learning video, um, I, I guess you can try. You just have to be transparent. So maybe you charge less or you don't charge at all in the beginning and you just say, I'm learning. So they're willing to take a chance on you or you charge a little bit until you get good at it. Um, but I, I'm all for figuring out however you can make money. For sure, I think that's a good idea. From Kimberly Maroon. What are the advantages of working with a rep or not? For example, a producer told me I'm at an advantage right now because I do not have a rep. Well, I think there's a lot of advantages, of course. I'm a rep, so I'm gonna say that. <laughs> there's probably some disadvantages too. Some photographers would tell you that. But I would think what my photographers right now are feeling is really confident that they have somebody like me in their corner 
helping them manage not only their business, but their anxieties, keeping them up to date on what, um, what I'm hearing out there and helping them pivot my business and their business to be relevant. So I've got deep relationships already. So when people, as do other, other reps, that's the point, um, so that when <clears throat> people need something, they know they can go, who are their go-to people. Um, that's a, a big plus for having a rep, especially now. Um, I'm getting information that I'm disseminating to my entire group that I'm not sharing with other people. So having a rep is a, is a good thing. Um, and, and that idea that you have an outside voice is really, really important. Um, I can't stress that enough. So um, the disadvantages of having a rep, you have an outside voice. <laughs> you have somebody telling you something you might not want to hear. Um, you have somebody imposing, sharing. Uh, yeah, um, that rep's going to ask you to spend money. You know, that rep is going to ask, give you a pretty long to-do list. And that leads us into our last question. At what point in your career is it beneficial to work with an agent and how do you find one? Well, I think um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but when you, you're ready for a rep when you have a body of work that is being positively responded to and you've done a lot of the legwork on your own and you have so much I don't want to say you have so much work you can't handle it. That's not right. But you you know what it means to to market yourself, and you have a database. I think it, you know maintaining your own database is and not depending on someone else to do that is is huge. Um, and how do you go about finding one? You know, there's lots of you know the workbook has lists of reps. At Edge has lists of lists of rep reps. Um, a photo editor has lists. So there's, there's ways to get lists out there. Ask your art producer friends who they like. Um, and I would say start a relationship with reps long before you want one. Because I give people the advice all the time. If you email me and say, hey, I'm looking for a rep, I'm going to say, sorry, I'm not looking to add to my roster. And our conversation is done. But if you email me and you say, Hey, I like your roster or hey, I saw you on the podcast on the webinar or whatever and I just want to share my work with you. Um, I'm going to keep you updated with new work. I will, you know, I will I try really hard to email everyone back and say, "Okay, great, thanks. I'll take a look." Or maybe you're catching me at a really bad time right now is a really bad time. I can't keep up with my emails to save my life right now, but um, you know, in general, I try and be really good about like checking out somebody's work, even if I'm not always replying. Um, I'm on lots of conference calls where I'm not, I'm just listening. So I click through all that stuff all the time. Fantastic. Heather, thank you so much for coming You're in. You're welcome. Giving us your You're time. Great. Sharing all of this information. I, I've really gotten a lot out of this and I hope that everyone else has that's tuned in. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. I've enjoyed it. And I'm glad we didn't spend so much time talking about all the scary negative things that are going on right now and really kind of concentrating on what we can all be doing right now to take advantage of the time that we have. Um, none of us ever have time and now we've got it. So let's use it. Yeah, definitely. So, so many of the insights you've given us are really universal. They're applicable now. They're going to be applicable throughout our careers. Great. Uh, so thank you. Happy so to much. help. We're open.